if I'm stopping and talking to Chiro. Hey, so I just wanted to say that if I'm stopping and talking to Chiro, um, uh, because I need to feed him more peanut butters from time to time, so I will be quiet and I can continue to speak with you. Um, so anyway, let me share my screen. Um, so the goal is to show how the vendor work. Um, in general, I'm not going to dive too deep inside, um, just in general from top to bottom. Um, and also I will give the options for asking questions uh, at the end. Um, so what, I'm, what I actually want to show is, is just what happened um, assuming I'm making a new project, let's call it testing form and JS. Um, maybe will run npm init. So I will have some um, like a JSON and not modules in my project. Um, right, so Let's install the Foreman vendor and I just want to demonstrate what you get with the Foreman vendor because for some people it's unclear. Um, so I will run npm install save the Foreman vendor. And while I do that, I will refill peanut butter for Chiro. Yes, so what we got, we should get a package JSON with the vendor, right? Um, so if I'm going to the vendor, um, basically what you expect to get with the vendor um, is the packages that vendor core give you, right? So if I go to the package JSON of vendor core, I expect to get all those packages so they will be available in my project and I can um, develop against them or run a production server against them. Um, so for example, Axios, uh, I will expect to get Axios in some way in the vendor. Um, but if I will go to the node modules, you will see that I don't have anything but the vendor. Right, so if I go to node modules, the vendors, um, I just got the vendor package. And even inside the vendor, I don't have a node modules folder. Um, so the vendor car come pretty empty without anything. Um, so when you install vendor, you don't get any node modules um, into your node modules or anything. What you actually get is this this folder, this folder um, which is going to contain some JavaScript and CSS files, um, which are which contain all the different sub packages, all the different node modules that the vendor give you, but they are compiled inside a JavaScript file or inside a CSS file when we want to provide CSS. Um, for example. For example, if I will take this file, let's try, let's have some carriage. Um, you can say that it's a compiled file um, that contain um, the, the modules that we put inside the vendor. Um, for example, you can say that window.jQuery will give you jQuery. Um, and Another example, if I will search for Axios, um, you can see that in this file, I have Axios compiled inside um, and all the Axios file got inside here. Um, and actually behind the scenes, um, when when we use it, it will actually be in something 
like this. Wow, I know it's difficult to see that, but focus on maybe I will make it bigger. Focus on this. You see that window at this location, form and vendor axios, will hold the axis object, <clears throat> the actual axis object. Um, so the linking between form and Shiro, you want to refill? Um, so the linking between form and axios doesn't happen on build time, it actually happens on runtime. Um, so every time you import axios, um, you do import axis from axis, right? Um, Webpack will not build axis for you. For you, instead, um, it will uh, tell the, the Webpack compiler that axis is an external module that we don't want to compile into our bundle, um, and instead, it will tell Webpack to load axis from the window object in runtime. Um, are there any questions so far? Is this a feature of Webpack that does this or learn it? What, what causes all of these things to be on the window object? Um, we manage the code that put it in the window object. Um, I can go into the code. Um, yeah, I will go into the code in a few, in a, in a few minutes. Um, to show how it happened behind the scenes. <clears throat> um, but anyway, all the all, all the packages from the vendor core, all those packages, um, the important thing to understand is that when you install the vendor, you don't actually get them as node modules. You get them compiled into one file that you are going to consume. Um, I have a question about that. Yeah. Uh, do the tests use this compiled file as well? No. Great question. No. Let's demonstrate from the other side. I will create this file and let's go back to my project that I created here. Yeah. So I got the package JSON and the mod mod the node modules and in the node modules, I will only have the form and vendor package. Right. Now let's install um, the form and test package um, and see what we get with the form and test package because we are going to, to get something totally different. Um, instead, as you see now, it's not downloading only the form and test package, it's downloading all the different vendor core packages. Um, so I will end up with all those packages inside my node modules folder. Um, and when I will run NPM test in Foreman or in a plugin that uses the Foreman test package, it will not test against those files that we saw here. It will test against the actual node modules. Um, and it will not be the locked version um, from the time of the compilation, right? It will be because if we compile it, once we compile it, um, it will take the version during the time of the compilation, the time of the build, and it will put the version of Axios that was available during this time inside this file. So if a new version of Axios show up, um, it will still be locked inside this file. Um, but because here it will, it will install the latest versions, um, when I will run test, it will test it against the latest versions um, that they will get now. And this is the reason why Patternfly, why we have snapshots, uh, broken snapshots, because uh, when Patternfly has a new version um, and there is, for example, breaking changes in the testing uh, environment, we get these errors, but not in the development nor in the production, only in the test, uh, testing environment, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, so you, you, when you run a, a server, a form and server, and it doesn't matter if it's a production server or a development server, you have like a web server that you go to form and with this, through this web server, um, it will use the compiled versions. 
Um, so even if you are in development and you are writing some feature and you're running Foreman and developing inside Foreman or a Foreman plugin, it will work against the compiled versions. Um, the only time it will work against um, all the other different node modules that now we have here in our node modules folder is when we run test. Um, maybe also when we run storybook, I'm, I'm not that sure about that. Um, uh, but yeah, any other questions so far? Uh, in production, we serve like the Webpack, the all the bundled assets and everything. Is that served through Rails? Yes. So in Foreman, when I will run the Webpack build in Foreman, it will not actually build the vendor because it already received the vendor, the vendor build uh, as a builded from NPM. Uh, it will get the compiled version from NPM. So once you run Webpack build inside Foreman, it will just copy the, the compiled files into your public Webpack folder, and then the Rails will just serve those files. And the actual linking between Foreman and the vendor will be on the runtime in your browser. This approach basically promises um, the same version across plugins. So for example, if a plugin imports Axios, it uh, still imports the same version like Form and Core, no? Yes, because the, the Webpack build now doesn't care that you have Axios here in your node modules. Um, so it so will... plugins, plugins also import from the window, from the same window object. Um, when you import in plugin, in for, for example, in Catello, you still get it from the window object. Right. As far as this package comes from, is one of those packages. Yeah, if it's one of those packages, it will Webpack will ignore the fact that it's uh, in your node modules folder, and it will use the one from the window object. And if it will not be in your window object, you will have a runtime error instead of build error. But we had to deduplicate a lot of the packages in uh, in our package.json in Catello. So I wonder if that's true for all plugins, because you could still, I think with a lot of them, they're still duplicated. So there uh, could be a I'm, different I'm version. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you? Yeah, we had to, um, we used to have like the form and vendor <laughs> on its own version in Catello. Um, right, so it's semantic only. At the end, when you will run the Webpack build, you, you will run it from form and so it doesn't really matter which form and vendor you have in your package JSON. Um, it's more, I see it more as a, as a way to declare that uh, in my plugin, I need to have a vendor version which is bigger than this version because the feature that I want to use are only exist in this version. Um, but how do we use packages that aren't in Foreman? Because we have a, a few packages that are not in Foreman. You just yeah. install them in your package JSON. And if, if you will have them in your node modules and they are not a part of those dependencies, Webpack will build them for you inside the Catello dist. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if the they're being duplicated inside the Catello dist and the form dist, if I've at the form vendor. Like we removed all the duplicate packages because, uh, well, they definitely were duplicated during in development, but. I'm wondering if they're also duplicated in production too. No, they should not be duplicated in production. Uh, also in development, they, should, they shouldn't be duplicated. If you run a development server using Webpack, you sh they shouldn't get duplicated. Um, they will get duplicated if it's a package that both Foreman and, uh, and another plugin use, but it's not a part of the vendor. Hmm. Okay. Um, so if I will add some some package that doesn't exist here to Foreman, and then I will add it to Catello, um, then I am having the risk that I will have two different versions compiled into my bundle. Chiro? Um, 
Um, the next thing that I want to show is how do we actually how do we actually use it? So we saw it in the side of the vendor, but in Foreman, how how Foreman and the build in Foreman know how to uh, how to do this magic behind the scenes and replace and tell all and tell that all those uh, node modules should be external and should be loaded from the window object. Um, if I will go here. Um, Um, yeah, so if I will go here, you will see that in, this is the, the Webpack build config of Foreman. When we build Foreman or a Foreman plugin, um, this is the configuration file that tell Webpack how to build Foreman or how to build the plugin. Um, and you see that here, this in this line, um, we are importing something from the Foreman vendor which is called Webpack Foreman Vendor Plugin. Um, so this is a Webpack plugin, which exists inside the vendor, um, which is the integration point between Webpack and the, the vendor, right? Um, so what this plugin gives me is basically, um, the, way I, the way I would use it, is here. I will, I will tell Webpack just use it as a, as a normal plugin. Um, I will take the mod production or development, and based on that, it will know which uh, bundle file to use, the minified version or the one which is easier to debug. Um, and that's it. As a consumer of the vendor, this is the only thing I will need to do to be able to to use all those different packages and tell Webpack not to compile them and use them as externals. Um, yeah, I, I think it's enough even information for one time. I, I guess let's go to, let's see if we have more questions. So if I'm in Foreman's directory and I do uh, the npm ls, uh, like I want to know what version of a particular package I have. Like uh, if I do npm ls react, because the Foreman vendor is that compiled version, is it going to um, is is it not going to extract that for me? No, the npm ls will never know that the vendor give you a React version. A re React package with some version. Um, you, if you will have React in your node modules and you will run npm ls React, of course you will get information about the React that installed in your mo node modules. But it will not be. It, it's not what you get when you run Foreman. So it, it gives us only the test environment. If, if I, for example, run npm ls <coughs> Axios, if I um, have it, you know, in the testing environment, I will get the version for the testing environment only, not for development environment, as far as I understand. All right. This explains um, a lot. <laughs> I'm trying to understand the, uh, the production environment um, with plugins. Are we shipping an individual bundle for each plugin? Uh, or is it all one bundled uh, file or files? Um, we ship individual bundles for each plugin. We have a foreman bundle, and then for each plugin, each plugin have its, has its own bundle. That's why we have to load the Catello webpack whenever we want to put a React component on a foreman page. Mm -hmm. Thank I you, guess I'm Hello? 
dog break. Yeah, uh, I'm just a refill, uh, but I, I can I can listen while I do that. Okay, I'm wondering um, the. I, I guess I don't understand how the deduplication of uh, packages works across form and, and plugins because if we have an individual uh, uh, bundle for Catello or form tasks, if I specify at the form and vendor again. Why wouldn't it just install all the form and vendor packages in that bundle as well? Um, I'm not sure I understand. So let's say in uh, Catello or form and tasks, I say at the form and vendor version six or, or whatever, um, then we're running our build steps. And why wouldn't it install all of the form and vendor packages inside that bundle as well, if it's an it individual bundle. It will not. Um, let's talk about Axios as the example. So we have Axios in the vendor. So when you build Catello, um, you will not get Axios into the Catello bundle file. Um, it will only get Axios in runtime Every time you use Axios in your source code, it will actually reference to the, to the Axios living in the window object. And it will not be inside your bundle. It will only be in the vendor if bundle. But Hello doesn't consume the form and vendor separately, right? Um, Catello doesn't actually consume the vendor. Um, Foreman is the one that consumed the vendor, and Foreman built Catello. Um, and to provide Catello the, so Foreman built Catello and vendor, Foreman built Catello against a vendor version, right? Um, but we previously had the Foreman vendor in Catello's package.json, so wouldn't that mean Webpack would build a Catello vendor for Catello and for Foreman? It, it doesn't mean anything. If you have the package.json in, in, in the, the vendor in your package.json or you don't have it, it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't. It doesn't matter what version it's you have in your package JSON of the vendor. It will all. It will always use the vendor that's living foreman. We still saw it in the node module. So, like it, npm install used to take a long time in Catello, but when we removed it, it, it's very quick now because it's just a few small packages. So that's what I'm kind of confused about because we used to see all of the, vendor, the form and vendor packages be installed in like Catello slash node modules? Because you, because you used to install the vendor core package. Um, yeah, so and that's, well, I'm asking that that that's what plugins are doing. Some other plugins are doing that still. So I'm wondering if there's still duplication going on. Well, yes, the duplication will be in your, in your testing environment only. Um, it will not mm -hmm. happen in production. I mean, in production or in, in web server, it will only use the, the version inside the vendor. Okay. So if uh, so, our two versions ship, the, I understand like one version is ultimately decided, but I'm wondering, is there a bundle somewhere that has do a lot of duplicate code? And I don't, I don't know because I don't really understand the build process enough to say like one way or the other. But it seems like they're almost treated as separate build steps. Yes. Yeah, so th there is no duplication because. Um, we don't actually build um, Axios or whatever into the bundles. Axios, Axios we live inside the vendor JS bundle, um, and once you build Catello, it will just it will ignore Axios or what other or whatever live in the vendor. It will just ignore it from the build, um, and only in your runtime in the browser, um, it will be available for you because you loaded the vendor JS file before you loaded Catello JS file. Okay, so there's like. And so where does that code mm -hmm. live that checks for those duplicates? Is that something Webpack is doing, or is that some uh, special code that we've written for formats? Um, it's it's a feature inside the Webpack. Webpack lets you use a feature called external dependencies. What external dependencies mean in Webpack? It's tell Webpack, don't build these dependencies, this dependency into my bundle. Instead. It will be available for you in the runtime, during in from uh, the window okay. object or from a different global object that you can choose. 
Okay, so we're basically telling Webpack to expect those dependencies to be already available, so you don't have to bundle them. Right. Um, I, if you will open some React tutorials about Webpack, you will see that one of the best practices when you build React application is to, to tell Webpack that React and React DOM are, should be external dependencies. And you tell Webpack not to build React in you, into your, your project. Instead, you tell Webpack that React will be available in the runtime. Um, and then the way you, you put uh, React in runtime, you just load the React.js file into the runtime, and then it will be available for your project. Gotcha. OK, yeah, that, I think that's the part I was missing. It's the web, web pack is uh, determining the external dependencies. Makes sense. Um, let me show some document about web pack externals, maybe um, so, you, so you can read it in your own time how it works. Um, but yeah, Webpack external is the mechanism Webpack give us to not build dependencies into our bundle and use them in runtime. So there is no chance for duplication because Webpack will just ignore that. What about CSS duplications? Is this approach fixes the CSS duplications? What CSS duplications? For example, we have Pattonfly for um, CSS rules. Um, mm -hmm. And the bundle, the CSS bundle from Catello duplicates these kind of rules. And we have twice the rules, twice the CSS files. Um, yes, yeah, so what, what the vendor does um, I'm not sure about current duplications, um, what the, but what the vendor does, it will give you, like it give you an, a JavaScript file with all the different libraries built inside the JavaScript file. It will also give you a CSS file. Um, so all the different libraries that inside the vendor, if they contain CSS or SCSS file, we compile them into this vendor.css file. Um, so we don't need to load pattern fly or some other side sheets into our um, into our bundle. So we can have a clean CSS file. From the other side, there is a limitation because of that, that because you don't build the CSS yourself, you get it already compiled. You cannot change variables and recompile it based on your chosen variables. Um, which is some issue with that. Um, so uh, what vendor give you, it will give you an SCSS file called variables SCSS. It will take all the different, well, it will take pattern file basically, it will take their CSS, SCSS variables and compile all the variables into one big file that contain all the different variables from all the different node models that we are using. So you can use them and recompile them in your project if you want. So for example, if pattern if I give you a variable and you want to use it and you don't want to use hard coded value, we can import file call the vendor slash CSS, var CSS variables, and you can import those variables from there. Um, any more questions? Um, yeah, one more question about um, versioning. Um, at the moment, Foreman um, consumes different versions of our meta packages. For example, we use test version 8 and vendor version 6. So do we have any issues with that mixing? Um, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware about issues, uh, but the way it will work is that if you use test version whatever, it a test, let's say if you use the formant test version six, this version know how to test vendor version six. Right? So if you are using vendor version seven and test version six, 
it doesn't really know how to test against version uh, version seven. Um, for example, maybe some node models will not be exist for you in a different version from what you expect. Um, right. So your compiled form and vendor will be the compiled version six, but your test where you get all the node modules will be the dependencies from version seven. So you might have a different list of dependencies in your compiled and your non-compiled version. Right, right. So the, the, the idea between the test package was to give you an environment so you can test something against the vendor. Um, and in order for it to be to to to, to be happen, you need to to use the same uh, the same test version as the vendor package the version. I think that the only part is Patternfly four doesn't correlated with the semantic versioning because when they updated um, the minor version, sometimes they have breaking changes because the major is four and it always before in Patternfly four. And so think about that. Yeah, so um, I think that we, we, we had some issues with patterns. What, what I see is that the everything is working well in the vendor until some package break the semantic version in groups, um, which uh, patterns are actually doing all the time. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I actually didn't know that. I, I, I noticed that we have so many um, snapshot changes, um, but I thought it's maybe normal and it's reflect a normal change, but um, yeah. Uh, I, I think we can pin with the tilde sign. So we, so Patternfly only updates the, um, the patch version and not the minor one. So we w won't have an update, for example, from 420 to 490, because you know this versioning is for sure has some breaking changes. Yeah, yeah. If if we will change the package JSON of the vendor core to have uh, tilde instead, I, I guess it will fix that. But if I understand, it breaks only in like in uh, tests snapshots, and you don't see it in uh, even in development while using the vendor core. Right, right. Because when you when you run test, you test against the the latest versions of your node models, or at, or at the latest version that your package JSON defined. Um, and when you run the development or the production server, it will run against whatever we compiled for you before during the compilation time. And is it a way to? And I don't know, maybe pin those version in a vendor core to the, the same uh, package lock uh, vendor core has. Um, well, if we will lock, if we will lock it, then we will, then when we rebuild vendor, we won't get the updated packages. Um, basically, when we get updates is when we. Um, you know what, actually, maybe it will be possible in some way, because we do have the locked file together with the JSON, together with the vendor. The thing is that NPM doesn't use the lock file when you install a package. It only uses mm -hmm. it when in your environment, when you develop this package, or when you build this we package. Do some, if we do some NPM CI, I think it takes the lock or something. Yeah, but if, if you do it inside Forman.js, um, yeah. when you install a package, you get all the sub packages of this package um, as the latest or whatever this package configured in the package JSON. I would like to recommend uh, mocking Patternfly uh, components because when not mocked, it can make snapshots really long. So in a remote execution, I started to like only mock the component that it will just show the props that it got. Maybe for snapshotting, mocking can work, but uh, when you want to test functionality, mocking you know breaks your component. Uh, yeah, but yeah, when you want to test functionality, there is break. less. 
uh, I, I think that um, in unit testing, when you want to test your your units, um, you should always mock whatever you receive from third parties. The only reason to not mock third parties in your test is when you want to test the high level integrations. And when you do that, there is no reason to use snapshot. Yeah, and then the snapshot, we won't have this issue because there won't be a snapshot taken in the integration tests anyway. But we still use consume the latest pattern flight version, so we might have other issues. Yeah, yeah. if they break something. Yeah. But still as a best practice, I would say yes. In our test, we should always mock pattern fly or whatever package we use unless we want to test high level integrations. More Next week, you should teach us how the builder works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, actually, I, I I thought that next week uh, I will go deeper into the vendor for the people who are curious about how it actually work inside and go into the source code because now I only show the result. Um, it would be nice to go into the source code and really show how it implemented. Um, yeah, I would like that too. Cool. Are there any other questions? So thanks, Savi, for this uh, um, deep dive. I think uh, it's much simpler than it looks. Um, okay, 